Hello and welcome to What Is My Podcast About. This is a podcast where on a fortnightly basis we get together to discuss a random topic, see if it might be what our episode is about. Today my name is Keith Ramsey and I am joined by Peter Akerley. Oh. And surprising everyone, Thomas Gion's back. Holla holla. He survived the uh, probationary period. Uh, hopefully he doesn't make it any longer than this podcast. <laughs> There was a vote. I was outvoted, so we're stuck with him for now. I found it surprising that I got to vote. <laughs> yeah, that, that was yeah. the odd part, but, you know, rules are the rules, and we don't make them. We just enforce them. Well, yeah, the yeah. rule was Matt gets a vote, but because you're standing in for Matt, you get to vote for Matt, and uh, we're going to have to rewrite the bylaws. That's what I've realized. Well, you know, happy to be here. Happy to prove my opinions are right. So, yeah, look forward to discussing all that we have today. Yeah, uh, B- uh, Thomas essentially bookends the year by being on the last and first episode of the year. Yeah, he's on the last episode of 2021 and the first episode of 2022. Jesus. Uh, that, that's a whole thing that he did. Good job. <laughs> in better years. Probably. But... <laughs> Well, I don't think you could have. I, I don't know that we would have been in this situation if it wasn't for those two years. <laughs> so they were somehow related to you being on the podcast. Everything built up to this moment. 2022 is going to be a great year. And we are uh, dictating that right here and now. So, yeah. Speak I'm calling for it. me. You can't say we are making that declaration. <laughs> you can make that declaration. I'm not willing to be on the side of history that decides 2022 is going to be a good year. Yeah, I... you know what, Peter? You can be a part of the rest of society <laughs> just decided to give up. Nah, nah. We are making 2022 great again. Wait, I shouldn't no. say that. No, no, uh, definitely not that way. No, okay. No. Uh, okay. You see, you were swaying me as one third of the vote, and then you said that, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to vote on this anymore. All right. We are not going to have another super terrible year. We've had too many of those. So I feel like it's gonna be a good year. Like I, I, I want to agree with you, but I just feel like each year has been progressively less than the last year. Although I guess 2021 was a bit of an upturn from 2020. It wasn't a great year, but it was better than 2020. Well, when so, you hit rock bottom, it's kind of hard to go below it. Uh, no, give me a powerful enough jackhammer, and I think I can get below rock bottom. Um, anyways, that's enough talk about the current year. Uh, so, the other day, I went out to the movie theater, because they're still allowing me to do that for some reason. Um, Not COVID-related, he's just been banned from every other video station. Yes, of course. Uh, it's a little bit weird because they weren't allowing me to have popcorn. I guess they knew my plan to throw it at the screen or some shit. Still not COVID related. Um, actually, no, me throwing popcorn at the screen is 100% COVID related. It's an act of civil disobedience. Um, but I saw the new Kingsman movie. Uh, and that was a whole thing. Uh, have either of you happened to see the new Kingsman movie? Uh, just the trailers. Yeah, cool. I have not. So it's a prequel movie that takes place during the prelude to and then duration of World War One. Yep. Um, With Rasputin being the villain, from what I understand. Uh, uh, Rasputin is one of the villains, but he's killed off roughly halfway through. And the uh, shadowy figure who's pulling strings from behind the scenes is actually responsible uh, for most things. Like, he's the one who hired uh, an assassin to kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand to strike off the match and launch the war. And he's just like a Scottish guy who really wanted England to lose the war, so he put all those plots in motion. Uh, the movie was, like, fun, I guess, but it was significantly less campy than the first two Kingsman movies, and in particular the first one. Um, so I enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it as much as either of the earlier Kingsman movies. That is our podcast's official opinion with regard to <laughs> Kingsman. You're just immediately doing away with the three votes, aren't you? 
well, yeah. Uh, if Thomas gets to do away with our three votes for what the year is going to be, I get to do away with the movie that I'm the only one who saw. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I have to accept that. But you also get one uh, super vote this uh, recording as well. You get to declare the podcast stance on something, and we don't get to argue with you. That's uh, how this works now. Oh, that's a lot of that, that is a lot of power. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot of power before we even get into our main topic. We're just giving Keith the power to declare our stance on something. So we could go through the entire podcast, all share our opinions, and then have Keith just be like, yeah, we said that, but here's our official stance on what we were talking about today. So I'm a bit scared of the power I just gave Keith. I'm going to save this for a very key moment. It might not be this episode, but so at some point, I will use that power. See, here's the problem. If you hold on to it long enough and Matt comes back, then Matt also gets a vote. No, he doesn't actually, because we remember Thomas is sitting in for Matt, so Thomas stole Matt's vote. Cool. It's true. Way to go, Thomas. He took yeah, power away from just, Matt while he was gone. He just threw it out immediately. <laughs> yeah, you, before anyone else had used the power, you declared you were using Matt's uh, use of it. So that's <laughs> fun. Uh, anything else going on in the world these days? Uh, nothing new in particular. Uh, the big thing for me is I have been playing through the whole Resident Evil series because I just felt like marathoning all of it. And I've yeah. uh, officially hit halfway by beating Code Veronica now. Nice. I, uh, I have recently been replaying uh, The Witcher 3 because I, The Witcher Season 2 came out and I watched that and was like, I should play the video game again. And I'd say I'm roughly halfway through that, so there we go. Team, halfway through games. <laughs> Thomas, what game are you currently halfway through? Or game series? Uh, I'm going back through Fallout 4, so halfway through another playthrough of that. Nice. Um, I did recently beat Inscription, which, if anyone likes card games, gotta play Inscription. Um, but I, I, amazing. I feel like saying card game, though, is leaving a lot off the table. I don't want to say anymore, but <laughs> it is an experience. Uh, I'm more of a, a fan of the chess segment. Yeah, that's really that's... only in there for just, like, what, ten seconds? <laughs> Unfortunately. It's like a whole thing. Really, it was uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! That was like, okay, well, when we start playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, well, fuck. I am about to win. It's like Yu-Gi-Oh! from like the first three seasons. Maybe the fourth season. Oh, man. It's just so good. And you can't spoil anything, because that would just be criminal. But, like, uh, there... I didn't play Pony Island, but, like, even still, I feel like there's no other game like this, you know? Pony Island and, um, uh, Hatsune, no, what's the... Doki Doki Literature Club? Yes. Doki Doki Literature Club are both, like, very, uh, meta horror, and this has that too, um, but it's still just so brilliant and unique. And, oh, 100%. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> and that's all we'll say about it. I don't right. want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't played it. That's true, and I will not give a definitive comment for reasons. Yeah, you can't give a definitive comment for fear of making that your stance on the podcast. Exactly. You gotta save that power. Yeah. Alrighty then. Yeah, so with that, I think it's about time we got into the topic for today. Uh, Peter, you, you love to explain why you like waiting to give the answer for what we're talking about, so how about you give the rundown? Sorry, what? <laughs> you got a whole spiel every time we get to revealing the topic. Oh, right, yeah, about how uh, now's the time we're going to get into the actual topic for those of you who did not read the title of this podcast, which, as I have stated before, and this is my official stance, it's not the podcast's official stance, obviously because I've already declared the podcast's official stance on something. But my official stance is that those are the best viewers, the ones who wait until we declare the topic of the podcast roughly a uh, quarter of the way into the podcast. And for the, So for those of you who haven't looked at the title yet, 
today's podcast is in fact about the Hawkeye Disney Plus series. Uh, and I, I guess we're kind of doing this one a little bit late, considering the Hawkeye series is very much a Christmas series at the same time. Yes. It's uh, six episodes, and each episode is about the sixth day before Christmas, or the fifth day before Christmas, so on and so forth, with lots of references to will they make it home in time for Christmas and all that stuff. Uh, it's very much so a Christmas series. Uh, and uh, spoiler alert, in case you had any doubt, he makes it home for Christmas. He does, in fact, make it home for Christmas. The amount of pressure they put on the concept of him making it home for Christmas and like his kids calling him and saying, it's okay if you don't make it home for Christmas, I fully assumed that this could potentially be a send-off where Hawkeye dies so he doesn't make it home for Christmas. I realize that's not a very Marvel stance to take of the main superhero for which this thing is titled is going to die by the end of it. Uh, that's Probably fair. In a show enough. called Hawkeye. Uh, to be fair, I-, I could see them killing off Hawkeye to like end like the Hawkeye mantle, but at the same time, I don't think Disney has the balls to kill off a beloved character on a Christmas movie. Yeah, it's yeah. one of those things where I could very well see it as like a plot from a comic book if they killed off Hawkeye and then had Kate Bishop fully take over the mantle of Hawkeye and thus... The name Hawkeye isn't actually a reference to Clint Barton, it's a reference to Kate Bishop, and that's why it's called Hawkeye, and they can kill off the main Hawkeye character. I could see them doing that as a Marvel comic book storyline. Couldn't see Disney doing that as a Christmas uh, story. (laughs) Merry Christmas, Hawkeye's dead and his kids are sad. Merry Christmas, all your heroes are dead. Uh, Yeah, that seems a little dark for them to do. Um, But, yeah, no, it's... uh, very heartwarming tale about Hawkeye trying to make it home for Christmas while he also fights the tracksuit mafia and tries to protect Kate Bishop because she accidentally took over the mantle of Ronan. Yep. So first things first, uh, just blanket thoughts of the series. Did you like it or did you hate it? I really enjoyed this series. It had one of my favorite Marvel characters of all time. Right. Is it Kazi the Clown? It's a uh, pizza dog. Oh, pizza okay. Dog is my Lucky the pizza dog, I believe, is his actual name. I'm sorry, but I did not like Hawkeye. And I thought it. I know there's going to be some contentious shit, but I thought this was the weakest of all the current Marvel shows, including the Netflix shows. I, I, I think I'm more in a. <laughs> I think I'm more in a middle ground for this one. Uh, so just to comment on that one, this is not the podcast definitive uh, answer to it, but I personally think uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier was the weakest uh, Disney Plus series so far. Uh, but I think this one, uh, I, I do have to agree, it wasn't the best. And there's a lot of stuff that kind of just blends together for me on like revisiting, looking back on it now. But I don't think it was the worst one. And that's because it has some a lot better narrative, I think, is the best way to put it compared to some of the other ones. To clarify my stance a little bit, I was not trying to say this was the best one. I enjoyed it, uh, but I definitely wouldn't put it at the bottom. I would probably actually be quicker. I would put this one above uh, WandaVision, at least for my own personal ranking. I wouldn't put it at the top. But that's still probably... Uh, Loki? Uh, Loki at the top. Yep. But uh, I would put this one above WandaVision for my own personal rankings. Uh... All right, let's get into this. What I now realize is probably going to be a disagreement for an hour. <laughs> uh, so uh, effectively what this story is, is it's a year after Avengers Endgame and Clint is watching the uh, Avengers musical, I guess, which uh, we also get a full length version of the I Can Do This All Day song at the end uh, as the post credit scene, which uh, I think a lot of people like found it very cheesy and like why they're doing this, but I think it's exactly what it needed to be. A hundred percent. I love that we got to see the full thing. The fact that it was all clearly like in reference to Hamilton uh, it was great and topical. And yeah, it, it was levity. It was, you know, it just like it's totally something that like we as a society would create to honor heroes while <laughs> only like partially understanding what actually happened. Like how, how uh, one of the key details is how they keep writing Ant Man in the yep. fucking Battle of New York. Um, or they kind of just play down Hawkeye. 
Yeah, Hawkeye's just a guy who's good with a bow, and that's, like, the entirety of his existence within that storyline, uh, according to the musical. Yeah, I think both of those are very true to how we would actually tell that story if it happened in real life. We would just be like, hey, here's a hero who we've seen do other things. Let's assume he was involved in that fight. And the hero who was actually there, eh, I don't know. He's not that marketable. Well, just like, that's what he is. The guy, you know, the one with the bow. Yeah. Uh, very true to how that would probably go. <laughs> well, that's kind of what he just wants to be. He's like, I'm just some random guy with a bow. Stop following me around. Yeah. But yeah, we get the introduction of his character. Uh, well, we kind of already know it is, but we see that he's starting to go deaf and all that stuff, which makes sense with all the shit he's gone through. And we got to get the juxtaposition of uh, Kate doing her thing where she wrecks the bell tower, which is named after Obadiah Stane, and they didn't take that down after, you know, the Tony Stark was... build this in a cave, blow up the city thing. Really, it was kind of a service of her destroying that, that bell tower. <laughs> they can now rename it the Tony Stark Memorial Bell Tower or something like that. Just like everything else. Yep. Everything's just the Tony Stark Memorial. Who knows, maybe they'll be lucky and name it the Clint Barton Mr. Uh, no, they wouldn't do that because it was destroyed essentially in his name. Um, <laughs> so they probably wouldn't name it the Clint Barton one. Uh, yeah, that's true. I missed that detail about it being the Obadiah Stane Bell Tower, but that is not a good look for them. Oh, 100%. Uh, we also get the really fun uh, moment when they're discussing Clint's uh, deafness and... Uh, Kate Bishop asks him when he went deaf. And she's like, huh, I don't know. And it's just a, like, smash cut of him just getting the shit kicked out of him throughout all the different Avengers movies. <laughs> it hasn't uh, been decided yet. Yeah, all the explosions, which, rightfully so, like, they should all have tetanus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I do think that is probably one of, like, the, the best jokes of the series so far, honestly. <laughs> I, I still got a chuckle to that when I went back and rewatched it. They showed a lot of, like, uh, a lot of clips from the previous movies, which was good. Like, a lot of the other shows, uh, uh, you know, they weren't able to show a lot of clips uh, because of, like, licensing rights. It's just so much cheaper to not, but, like, have reference to it. But we saw a good number of clips of characters, you know, uh, few times showing like uh, the invasion of New York and uh, and Black Widow. Yeah, I think this might be the series, aside from Endgame, obviously, where it's built around the concept that you kind of have to know everything already and you just can't just go in. Yeah. Uh, this one did do a lot of uh, heavy lifting and the like rehashing old events. One of the things I liked is that they didn't always tell it from exactly the same perspective. Like, when we see the Battle of New York in the first episode, we're not shown it from the perspective we saw it normally. We spend most of it inside of an apartment, and then we hear people, like, running away, and then the wall gets fucking blown off, and we see the Chitauri flying around and Hawkeye jumping off a fucking building. Like, it's not just, hey, the Battle of New York happened, remember it, it's... The Battle of New York happened, here's a quick reminder of what it was like, but also, here's a different perspective, so we're not just showing you something you've already seen before. Yeah, and I think it does a good job of explaining, kind of like, for a normal person, going the leap of, I need a bow and arrow to do stuff after her father dies, I don't think fits, but with her being in that like young age, and the traumatic experience, piled with seeing that, and her father's death, uh, it makes sense that she would immediately go to, ah, I know, the bow and arrow will be my tool. Yeah, it's the combined trauma of losing a parent during that fight, and also watching just a regular fucking guy jump off a building while surrounded by aliens and superheroes. Like, it's a very... They do a good job of explaining how she landed at the kind of position she did. Yeah. Yeah, so, going through this, we are, of course, like, in, initially introduced to our, I guess, main... Um, yeah, we'll say main character, which is not Hawkeye. Um, I mean, they both felt like they were main characters, Kate Bishop and uh, yeah, Clint Burton. They're both, they're both main. Yeah, we'll say so. So, um, yeah, and they, they make a point of how smart and creative and, like, uh, 
dangerous she is as like a yeah, she got her black belt at 14 or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, she's like won this whole wall of uh, tournaments and uh, championships and whatnot. So, like, at the start, they, they make it seem like she's really competent and, like, a good fighter and everything. And then I feel like we got away from that. Like, more and more... Um, it was less about like what she can do and more so just them reacting and her becoming uh like her becoming just like a series of problems for Clint to deal with. Really, I kind of felt it was more so like I, I get what you're saying, but it felt to me more that was her inexperience with the real life stuff. She had trained her whole life to it, but was never really involved with it because she was sheltered by her mother. So this was really her first taste of that, you know, fighting crime, I guess is the best way to put it, aspect that she was aiming for. Yeah, and I think one of the key scenes with regards to that is at the end of the first episode, when the tracksuit mafia decides to rob the auction, and we see her fighting off members of the tracksuit mafia, and her training definitely comes into play and is very helpful because we see her on her own fighting off... I don't know, probably like a half dozen armed villains in that fucking basement, and then she runs away. But it's also clear that she's not fully experienced because she doesn't, like, get away with it. She leads them back to her apartment without thinking about it. So there's both signs that she doesn't fully know what she's doing, but also signs that she is well-trained and her training is paying off. It's just not quite paying off as much as she might have wanted it to. Like, uh, obviously she's inexperienced and she's trying to get that experience from, uh, you know, from her mentor, her idol. Um, and yeah, she keeps throwing, uh, screwing things up, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It, it was weird how like her character didn't really get any growth. It was instead her character was, uh, just needing to prove herself like um and, and of course they introduce uh a really popular well-known villain to be like all right this is the obstacle for you like you must beat this guy and then we will recognize you as a cool and competent character and like she does by learning by using a technique that was taught to her by her mentor but you know it's not like it was a useful technique it, it was just it was only useful in that instance you know what i mean i mean i'm sure she'll find she, better use for that in the future and, and i agree with you I, I feel like her having to fight kingpin at the end didn't do anything to service the story because to me it felt like the big payoff to her growth would have been when she turns her mother in uh because yeah. Her whole thing was, I gotta protect my family, and I think Kate at the beginning would have tried to protect her mother and not tried to, like, do what was right. And the, at the end, she realizes, oh, as Clint's been saying, sometimes there's gonna be, like, sacrifices you have to make, and they're not the ones you want, but it's what you have to do. And her turning in her mother was that, uh, a pretty much payoff to that growth. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, like, I don't think she so has grown in the way of learning how the world works, and how... Like, she can no longer be sheltered. Like, this is what she's uh, going to be dealing with from now on. Like, uh, tough, difficult choices now that this is her life. Yeah, because I think... Another key detail in her growth was uh, her treatment of Jack, where initially she's very suspicious of Jack and doesn't trust him because he's got, like, resting villain face, essentially. Um, like, she just kind of assumes he has all the characteristics of what she assumes a villain is, so she just assumes he's bad. And then the moment she finds his name on some public document, she's like, this confirms every suspicion I've ever had, and immediately jumps on trying to get him arrested. But then by the end of the film, to realize he's actually not a bad guy, and her, her mother, who she was willing to defend, turning her in instead, uh, I think was another key moment of growth for the character. Uh, and I think they did do it. Sorry, go. I was going to say, and I need to say, Jack is probably my favorite thing from this whole series. Jack is pretty great. And uh, from the comics, he's also the swordsman who is uh, the person who trained Clint Barton uh, before he was Hawkeye. 
And I, I know it's unlikely, but I would love if they kind of have it that he trains, uh, like, in some capacity. Kate just trains her in some capacity. I want him to stay in the series. Yeah, I, yeah. I would actually be into him taking on kind of a mentorship role to Kate in the future. Because he probably feels partially responsible for the things that happened because it involved his family, even if he wasn't actually responsible in the slightest. Um, also, to go back a little bit to like the trick she learned, I feel like that's just classic movie making of halfway through the story, they learn a new technique, and then that technique ends up being exactly what they needed to defeat the final boss. Like, yeah. I can understand how that's a bit cliched, but like, I don't feel like most people would complain about that if it was in any other context. I feel like it's just kind of a thing to complain about. Oh, this was written the way every other movie was written. Well, it, of course it was. It's a Marvel. Well, it, it was thing. less it's about not gonna be breaking like, the ground that, because, yeah, like Roger, like we all recognize the cliche, but like, hey, this is an inexperienced character learning to become stronger and more efficient as a hero. You know, what cool technique did she learn from this master of trick arrows and? you know, spy, uh, espionage, and swordsmanship, and, oh, no, uh, she doesn't learn anything cool. She learns how to, like, flip a quarter or, like, a small, like, coin <laughs> in such a way that she can hit, like, a button. Can, can you turn off your TV with a coin by throwing it across the room? If I was learning under an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., who you know, fought alongside gods and monsters to save the world, I would learn something, anything else, you know? <laughs> and then you would lose the fight against Kingpin. It's as simple <laughs> as that. Like, and that was the thing, was none of the trick arrows were working against Kingpin. He was just tearing them out of his chest as uh, he was getting hit. And it was kind of creative of her to think to use this technique that, like, was presented as this is a way to press a button from across the room, or the way Hawkeye initially described it, he could kill someone from 20 meters away with a quarter. And her thinking of that technique that she learned, but not using it to try and hit him in the eye or his glowing weak spot or something, but instead hit one of the trick arrows on the bottom, thus also using the trick arrows that she was learning about, and procking all of them to go off at the same time to hopefully knock Kingpin the fuck out. I'm just saying, it, I think it was more creative than you're giving it credit for. Oh, although I, I creative, but I think it was doing them a disservice. Like her as a character should have learned like some cool arrow trick. I just I don't think that's true because that kind of takes away from uh, Kingpin's character if the way he's defeated is a special arrow specifically designed to take out the kingpin or something like that. Well, it's taken away from his established character. Well, actually, I think him, like Hawkeye's passing on, you know, the coin trick works because, like, uh, even going back to the comics, Hawkeye's whole mentality is anything's a weapon. Uh, as you know, the, the whole purpose of my life as a weapon is showing that he's just resourceful, and that's kind of his skill over, like, his accuracy. He's accurate, yeah, but he's so resourceful that that accuracy is able to be used very effectively. So if using anything to trigger anything else is kind of like the big Hawkeye thing anyways. Yeah, and to go back a little bit, if he, if she did just use a trick arrow or something like that, then that's less her defeating him and her just using a tool that was given to her to defeat him. Whereas this is her using a technique and making it her own to win the fight. Uh, now, I do have a question about how she defeats uh, Kingpin. Uh, I personally liked that they did the fight that Kingpin didn't even give a shit about who she was. They were just trying to get out of the room constantly, and she was just being a nuisance, because they didn't play off like, oh, she beat Kingpin in a fair fight. It was, Kingpin wasn't even trying, and that's why yeah, she King, won. King, yeah, I like that payoff as well, because it, once again, doesn't take away from the Kingpin character of it not being a true 1v1 between Kingpin and Hawkeye, or Kate Bishop, whatever, if you don't want to give her the Hawkeye name yet. Um, it not being a true 1v1 between them, and that's how she's able to win, because he's just constantly trying to get out of the room to kill her mother, and she's just trying to force him to fight her so that she can actually win. And it's, once again, another example of throughout the series of no one taking Kate Bishop seriously, except for the tracksuit mafia, I guess, who are fully convinced that she's Ronan. Everyone else is just like, you're just a kid, I'm trying to keep you away from this situation. And ultimately, that's what ends up allowing her to beat fucking, uh... 
Kingpin is the fact that he's also just thinking of her as a kid and trying to get past her to deal with the mother. Mm -hmm. Which, <sighs> yeah. Again, I don't think it did her as a character any service because Kingpin never like recognized her as a threat or was like, uh, uh, what is your name? Like, who are you? It was just like, ah, uh, whatever, girl. I mean, I think that's Still, kind yeah. of what the whole... S oh, go on. No, no, the, go on. I was going to say, and that's kind of the purpose of the series, though. It's people taking her seriously. Yeah, and I think it's kind of, like, kind of, in our universe, the purpose of the series as well, is no one's going to take Kate Bishop seriously if she just shows up in a movie and declares herself Hawkeye. But if we have this series to establish her character, kind of show her growth, then in a future Avengers movie, if they have her show up and say she's taking over Hawkeye's place, people still won't be super psyched about it, but people will have a bit more understanding of where she came from and have an understanding of who she is as a character uh, to get there. Yeah, and a lot of the complaints I've seen uh, people make about this is, uh, have you guys read My Life as a Weapon? Uh, no. A long time ago. Uh, so in the comic, the roles are actually kind of reversed, where Kate Bishop is like the very skilled, like no nonsense person, and uh, Clint Barton is actually kind of just the fuck up about everything. Uh, so a lot of people complain that they kind of reversed the roles and kind of made Kate Bishop stupid in a sense, which I, they have to establish it in a world where we already have Clint Barton uh, defined as a certain way. So I, I personally don't have an issue with it, but that's been yeah, one of the main complaints. It told one of the same stories without having to drastically change a character who already exists in the MCU. And that's one of the things I think everyone just has to find, fucking learn about the MCU, is it's not going to be telling the stories the exact same way that they're told in the comic books. It's going to be telling the same stories, but because the characters are established and this is kind of the definitive MCU version of the character, it's going to have to tell the story in a way that fits the characters as they've already been introduced. I mean, that's the, the best way to do it. Yeah, in the comic books, if they're going to tell a story, they can just set it in a different universe than the other ones if they want to change something about the characters. If they did that with the MCU, it would lessen the emotional impact if it's always just a different Clint Barton in each story. So they kind of have to just accept that it's going to be the same Clint Barton and find a way to tell the story with the character as he already exists. Well, that, and if we wanted a shot-for-shot -shot retelling of each story, just go to the original source, right? Uh, the yeah, fact that the MCU the exists in its own way is the, is the twist that make it interesting. Yeah, if each story played out exactly the way that they did in the comics, then the stories wouldn't be that interesting, except for people who don't read the comics. And then why are you making the movies if it's specif specifically adaptations of comic books that aren't for the people who read the comics? That'd be a very weird way to go about doing things. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. You know, yeah. like the people who keep complaining, like, oh, it wasn't like it is in the comics, like, who cares? Why wasn't Adam Warlock there when Thanos snapped to impress death? Witness Thanos copter! Yeah, why wasn't Thanos spending his entire time talking about how he really just wants to fuck death? Why was that not a major plot point of the Infinity War saga? Yeah, like, these are the same people who complain, uh, you know, like, uh, about books. You know, why, why was all the stuff not left out of my, uh, I don't know, name it, uh, name a team adventure movie but it's like a movie is like two to two and a half hours and yet you want to put like 12 hours worth of content and characters and you know material into this two hour movie it's like it doesn't work to something to cut and, you know like for the most part movies do a good job of that the only valid argument in that arg uh, against that would be the fact that Mark Wahlberg doesn't have the Sully mustache in the Uncharted movie. He better fucking get that mustache. I mean, the trailer doesn't look like he has it. Like at oh, the end right, of so the what movie, we need? they're probably gonna do something where he grows out a mustache. Oh, end credit scene, uh, mustache origin. Yeah, I think what we need is uh, we need an internet campaign like we had when Sonic first, uh, the first trailer for Sonic movie came out, yeah. and everyone just complained about that. And then they don't even reshoot the movie. They just do like fucking uh, Justice League and have yeah. digital artists go in and painstakingly, instead of drawing over a mustache with a regular lip, draw over a regular lip with a mustache in every fucking frame that Mark Wahlberg appears in that movie. 
That's what I want to happen. The CGI mustache. Technology's got to be getting good enough for a CGI mustache by this point. I mean, the de-aging, especially looking at Spider-Man with Alfred Molina, it's getting better, so I don't think a mustache is that much of an ask. Maybe they just get Mark Wahlberg to grow out a mustache in real life so that they can get the perfect, like, composite. Uh, I know this is completely unrelated to what we're talking about, and we might have mentioned <laughs> it on a previous podcast. But uh, it just reminds me of one of those fun facts I learned, which is uh, apparently uh, Disney and Marvel Studios have been, like, going through and collecting a back catalog of all the actors and all the movies they've appeared in beforehand so that if they ever need to, say, de-age uh, Samuel Jackson to do the fucking... Uh, captain marvel movie they have a whole bunch of like catalog of this is what he looked like when he was younger and the one actor that like mcu and marvel studios has come out and been like yeah we're not worrying about getting a bad catalog of this one is fucking paul rudd because they just came out and said paul rudd doesn't age so <laughs> use him as he is for a younger paul rudd and it'll be fine he still looks uh, the same as he did 20 years ago so that's just a fun fact that i found out about a while back him and keanu reeves So, okay, so sticking with her. Yes, uh, sorry, back on topic. Yeah, sticking with Kate Bishop. Um, yeah, like, uh, all in all, it was nice that, they like, obviously, she gets accepted as his partner, and they they spend the holidays together, which is, you know, him doing something nice for her to make up, or to pay her back for what she did. Um, but yeah, um, uh, all in all, like, you, uh, we don't really see where they're going next or what the next thing is. The end credit scene is just the musical. So, um, from, from all this, we got one new character and Hawkeye doesn't really go through any sort of arc you know i think they kind of like do a low-key version of the arc from my life as a weapon where he learns to like community is an important thing and having you know some sort of social circle uh because in the comic it was him because he take the tenement building is he kind of buys it and keeps the mafia out and at the end when he's about to be defeated everyone comes together and helps him i think they were trying to go for that but it comes off more with everyone's just really eager to be around a superhero doing superhero things so they can be cool The, the guys that show up and, and help, like, he's okay with, but it's not a, a him learning to make friends shouldn't be a thing, because he was already a part of a team. Yeah. You know? I like, think... Already yeah. had him. I, I know he was more of the loner, but the fact that he was a part of a team through uh, several movies at this point, for for them to then go okay now for his origin or like his own series he's going to be a loner that has to learn to like people just like he did back in those other five or six movies. I mean, I I think there's a pretty good reason for why he would have to do that because if you remember his storyline, yes, he was a part of a team and worked alongside other people. Then his entire family died, and he went off on essentially a solo assassin. I don't interact with anyone. I just kill people who should have died in the snap. And then the moment he gets brought back from that, it's by his best friend who dies like a couple days after she brings him back from the brink there. So I think it's a little bit justified in-universe why he might have gone back to being a bit of a loner who doesn't like interacting with other human beings. Well, So it might not be him learning for the first time, but it could be him relearning that other people are a positive aspect in his life. I, I do think it's a bit simpler than that, though. He's always been a person that doesn't like the attention, right? And him being a famous Avenger that saved the world gives him unwanted attention, and that's why he kind of keeps solo. I think almost what could have been better for his character, uh, have like an end credit scene after like everything's done, like just a little joke, but have like him and Jack back with the LARPers, like actually partaking in their thing and having fun with it of some sort. Like he, he actually enjoyed the LARPing. Could have been a funny way to do it. To be fair, I, like they didn't like do a big deal of it, but I think he did enjoy the LARPing watching that scene when people start like coming at him and he starts like spinning out of the way and like tapping them on the chest and stuff like that. I think he was having fun by the end of the LARPing, even if they're not going to call attention to it. 
But yes, if they had a, confirmed that by doing a post credit scene where he comes back to do more LARPing, I think that definitely would have been a positive influence on the series as a whole. Yeah, I think it just gets the idea of him growing a bit better. Yeah, instead, you know, um, he doesn't even interact with any of them at the end of the at the end of the series. It's yeah, it's like, like I'll keep Kate Bishop, the rest of you can fuck off. Yeah. So thanks for helping. Bye. <laughs> like, and and that's kind of why like, uh, I feel they didn't do a good service to a lot of characters. So, without jumping around too much, like Jack, like, what the hell was his story? So Jack... <laughs> He's just a lovable fool. Roger. Like, Roger, like, lovable fool, he's the red herring, like, they, they go chasing uh, a lead on him, but then, what happens after that? Like, <laughs> well, he shows up with a sword in the final episode, and then just, like, Chekhov's gun, oh, man, Jax could use that sword, it's the last episode. Yeah, so he's like, uh, Roger, so, my fiancé just had me arrested, um, I, you know, I dropped the charges, so I'm gonna show up to the party, where my, I, I guess, ex, fiance, and her crazy daughter are, and a number of friends that, you know, clearly I don't get along with all of them. I'm going to show up with a sword <laughs> and act like everything's totally normal. Then, uh, then, like, all hell breaks loose. So he starts, like, I'm pretty sure he kills a number of people. <laughs> At least three. Uh, yeah. Like, and so he goes, like, uh, sword fighting people. And then uh, they're like, all right, good job. One of the LARPers asked him about LARPing. Uh, and then that's it. I'm like, so what? what's he doing next? What's his character doing next? Is, uh -oh. he, is he going to like join the LARPers? Is he obviously breaking off that engagement? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not even sure he even knows that he was framed by her mother. Yeah. It's like... As far as he could tell, his mo her mother like, had perfect reason for uh, calling the cops on him because his name was in charge of that gang. So I don't yeah. think uh, Sloan Enterprises or whatever it was. So from his perspective, the mother probably had a perfectly justified reason for getting him arrested. But as for game. but as for what they could do with Jack, I already gave two good examples of seeing him LARPing with Clint Burton or he takes on like an Alfred role for Kate Bishop. I think that's or, the best fit for him in the future, is him taking on kind of a mentor slash, yeah, Alfred-esque role with regards to Kate Bishop. Because it, it comes off that he's be even better than her with the sword, is what I got yeah, from it. So, I feel like a reverse Alfred role would have been nice. Like, oh, Kate, why don't you come work for me? You can, like, be my butler, uh, <laughs> and I'll train you on how to be a sword. Because, like, like, he even said, I've never worked a day in my life. He's not going to be a butler for somebody. No, oh, I don't mean, like, work for her, but, like, take on, like, I'm going to teach you how to do the sword thing, right? Yeah, yeah, when I say an Alfred-type role, I don't literally mean be her butler <laughs> as she's a billionaire. I kind of meant more so the fact that Alfred looks out for uh, Batman and does a lot of his day-to-day -day life helping. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a butler, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Kate, who needs a job, and probably can't work for her mother's company anymore. Um, you know, once they investigate everything, um, she's gonna need um, she's gonna need a place to work. Um, also, yeah. So getting into a number of issues I have with the show, just picking up and dropping plot points. What do you mean so, getting into this entire podcast? <laughs> bringing up issues with the series, but yeah, all right, no, 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 like. Like we we're going along talking about certain characters, but there's the detective who shows up and is like, "Hey, Kate Bishop, we need to talk about you know X, Y, and Z related to why your house got firebombed." And she's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow morning." And then she just blows him off and never goes to talk to him. There's never like a, a scene where the cops are after her and she has to like. Avoid the detectives. It's just, uh, yeah, we'll talk about it later. And then they don't. And That's fair. Like, think, okay. I think the only payoff we get to that at all is we see one of the detectives in the office when she goes in to visit her mother at work. And that's the extent of it. And you're right. It 
that is one thing that I feel like they could have cut that one scene of her getting a call from the cops, and it wouldn't have had any impact on the story whatsoever. So I will admit that one is a bit of a oversight on their part. Yeah, it was introduced as like, oh, here's another chaotic plot thread that our characters are going to have to dance around. And no, they just ignore it completely. All right, the cops are investigating, but they're not going to put any effort into investigating. Yeah, uh, there was another one that I thought was going to be one of those loose thread plot lines, and that was the watch, which was the central part of the story. And it like it doesn't pay off to like the exact end. It's like, oh okay, no, no, but it doesn't pay off. Well, it, it does. does. She's Agent no. Thirteen. That's yeah. the payoff. Uh, also known as Mockingbird. But, yeah, uh, which her character is like uh, not her, but uh, the character that she's supposed to be is in Agents of Shield. Yeah, but Agents of Shield is like loosely canon at best. Yeah, it's at that nebulous point where like the events kind of happen, and everything in the MCU is canon to Agents of Shield, but everything in Agents. Of Shield well, not not even because uh, Thanos never happened in uh, Agents of Shield. Oh right, yeah, no, it's just. Not to mention series. the world also blew up in Agents of Shield, and they had to go to the future to go back to the past to stop it. Yeah, I do about that, and it's just one of those things where like. The stuff that happens in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has never really had any huge bearing on the rest of the MCU. Yeah, I think if it's going to be canon in any sense, it's an alternate reality now that they got the timelines going. Yeah, now that uh, Loki can just cross over and meet Agent Coulson. Uh, Again. That'd be yeah. <laughs> that, that actually, I would actually love to see that reunion. Like, that would be pretty cool. Um, and we're like, they have to team up to stop Loki Season 2 from destroying everything. So here's what they do. Loki season 2, he brings over characters from out like shows that are no longer canon. So Age of Shield characters, Agent Carter characters, and just pulls them all together and he makes a team that does time stuff and Agent Coulson's in there. Yeah. That or it's just Loki going to every one of those shows that aren't actually canon and just be like, "Not nah, this is all variant and just destroy <laughs> it. It's just the finale for every episode is Loki showing up and destroying that entire universe. X Men Origins Wolverine. Nope. But, okay, so my point though for the watch is that that is the initial conflict that starts the whole chain of events. Was the tracksuit mafia shows up and they're looking for the watch? Why? I think it's because it was uh, with the Ronin stuff, so it's probably speculated that it would be a hint. I don't think they made. I'm pretty sure that like there was never that connection because the watch is sending out a um, a signal, which they somehow couldn't track uh, until they knew that the watch wasn't destroyed for some reason. Well, the watch is sending is sending out a GPS signal or something like that, but I don't think they were constantly looking at the computer like. Is the watch still in Avengers headquarters? Is it still in Avengers headquarters? It was one of those things where after the uh, heist happened and all that stuff went missing, they're like, by the way, we should probably double check and make sure the watch is still in Avengers headquarters. Oh, no, it's not. Let's go track it down. That's what I assumed the whole reason that they didn't track down the watch and didn't know that it had immediately gone missing was. Yeah. It's the kind of thing they wouldn't think to be tracking until something like this happened and stuff that was supposed to be at Avengers headquarters went missing. I mean, I feel like this, the reason the watch is such like a confusing thing on like what exactly was the point of it aside from just revealing like, you know, that his wife was Mockingbird was the fact that like they never really explained why they needed the watch or how it yeah. was like going to reveal who Hawkeye was. Cause, oh yeah, they can track down agent 13 from, uh, uh, you know, the shield it was the person that's linked to Ronan. Well, who the fuck's Agent Thirteen? Yeah, yeah, and like, so the mafia shows up. They come looking for the watch, and then, oh, surprise! Ronan's here. Wow, uh, we weren't expecting this. Okay, now everyone hunt after Ronan, and then they all just forget about the watch. So yeah, I got the feeling that the watch didn't actually have any connection to Ronan because. They weren't concerned with Ronan, and in general, the group as a whole didn't seem to care about Ronan. As we know uh, from later on, Kingpin's the one who hired Ronan to kill off uh, Maya's dad. So no one was looking for Ronan until well, Pete started running around. Maya, Ronan. Maya was always looking for Ronan. Yeah, Maya was. Right, but I think right, the but she wasn't they... like actively hunting him down. 
until until yeah, Kate showed just, up in the Ronin suit. Yeah. So I think the reason they were after that watch at all had nothing to do with Ronin. I think they were specifically after Agent Thirteen for whatever reason and believed that that watch might lead them to Agent Thirteen. I don't oh, think it had anything yeah, to do with Ronin, indeed. and it just happened to be a coincidence that they found out about Ronin when they stole the watch, and that led to everything else happening. Yeah, and and yeah, like I said, we don't know why they were after the watch. It's like, yeah, I mean that could be a cool thing. Led them back to. I mean, that could be something they're setting up in the future that would be cool, because uh, seeing, like, Linda Cardinelli, uh, who plays uh, Laura Barton, have her, like, come into some aspect, like, she's a great actress, so seeing her be, like, a bigger role in the MCU could be interesting, but I think it would have to be, like, MCU-adjacent stuff. Yeah, it would have to be a separate series that's just kind of, like, an origin story showing Agent 13's life or something like that, and it could be that kind of idea, and could even have fucking Kingpin show up in that and have her fuck over Kingpin at some point. And that be the origin behind why Kingpin was looking for the watch or something like that. Yeah. Because he wanted to track down Agent 13 to get revenge for something she did in the past. And it actually has nothing to do with Hawkeye. And it's just Hawkeye happens to be married to her and happens to get involved. Now, that could all work. But it was very poor pacing and very poor planning that the, the series' main conflict spawns from this. And we don't even know what this is. like. It's a loose plot thread that is never addressed again or brought up or like it's resolved basically because the uh, the watch is returned to her at the end. And it's like, oh, great. I have it. OK, why was it missing? I don't know. <laughs> why were they after it? I don't know. Well, for keep coming for it. I don't know. For why it's missing. I think they did a good job of like, implying that Clint was using it as a keepsake for her when he was off doing his vigilante stuff around the world. And then when the Avengers base got blown up, he kind of just left the Ronin stuff there as, like, uh, hopefully it gets destroyed in the rubble. Yeah. yeah. It's all implied. Yeah. We don't really get a good sense of it all. None but uh, but I, I do agree. There was some pacing issues with the series itself. Uh, I felt like, like, I know that they're doing the Echo series, but her stuff did feel like it was a little, like, just quick. And like she wasn't, and it's because she wasn't in the series actually that much. She was here and there for like antagonistic scenes, but not a lot of things. But again, they're doing the Echo series, which I, I, I'm a little upset they announced it before the series even finished, kind of giving a hint of, oh, I know where her character's going to end up by the end. Yeah. Uh, the other one is, uh, I had some issues with the Elena stuff getting resolved. Although I do want to state that. Uh, Elena and Kate working together is probably one of like the best things, and I need a buddy cop team up with those two. Yes, and that's what a lot of people are saying, and they're right. That is the best part of the series is seeing her, well, seeing them both just interact with each other, hang out, fight. Yeah. That whole scene where she's uh, cooking craft dinner in fucking Kate's burned out apartment, and like trying to have like a fun, happy conversation, and Kate's just like, why are you trying to kill my friend? She's like, he's not really your friend. Do you want more uh, fucking hot sauce on your fucking craft dinner? She's like, nah, I'm good. All right, I'll just put it all in the pot since you're done eating. Now, uh, here's a fun thing for you guys. Uh, so Florence Pot is actually very notorious for actually eating the food when she's ever on scene. So most people use a spit bucket where they take a bite, chew, spit it out. Apparently she just eats all the food, and she's actually the one who brought the hot sauce into that scene. <laughs> so she was just eating craft dinner actually during the scenes and they're just putting hot sauce on it now I really liked her in Black Widow mm -hmm. um, she's just a great character because she's fun and chaotic yep. um, however I found in a number of those scenes as great as she was she didn't really feel that into it you know like. yeah I felt like the, the motivation because it was she was hired by Kate's mother to kill uh, Clint, okay. yeah. which we saw at the end credit scene of Black Widow that it was through uh, Dreyfus's character. Yeah, she's the one who passed on the information that Clint was responsible for her sister's death. And then, obviously, characters through it were saying, oh, I didn't kill her, like, or Clint didn't kill her, this is a misunderstanding. And then it's all, the whistle at the end that kind of clues her in, like, oh, they were friends, but doesn't everyone already know that, like, Hawkeye and Black Widow are, like, cool? Yeah, 
like part of the argument she was making was you guys were friends and yet you killed her in the end why did you do it yeah and his response was i didn't kill her trust me we were friends and she's like oh you guys actually were friends okay i believe you yeah, I think the series muddled her motivations for why she was going after him, and then because of that, the payoff just came off a little weird. So, yeah, like, it wasn't great. Yeah, and um, a lot of it was, of course, she was emotional and distraught at like having lost her sister and not being able to do anything about it, and the one person who could have done something about it didn't fight hard enough, which yeah. is something she brought up during the fight. And that works but oh it's just uh, because there was so many different people telling her go kill clint and then she never once questions it is well, what came of, off as weird to me it's one of those weird things of she keeps you getting told clint's the one who killed uh, your sister go kill clint and she's just fully on board with it and then one person tells her uh you should figure out who's telling you to kill clint she figures out who's telling her to kill clint doesn't question it beyond that, tries to kill Clint, and then has a conversation with Clint, and she's like, ah, yeah, whatever, it's big of a deal, I'll guess I'll just go now. And it was just, it, they didn't, I would argue they didn't do her character justice, and it yeah. just kind of felt like she was less motivated by her own personal desires, and more so just kind of like a leaf floating on the wind, just whoever happened to have the last conversation with her is what she was choosing to do in that moment. Yeah. It was entirely based on the yeah. last and, conversation she had. And, uh, like for a motivational standpoint like yeah if they were going to keep doing like that oh she's distraught and she's just emotional because she's like obviously in mourning they wouldn't have had her keep flip-flopping every five seconds where she's just having this like buddy buddy conversation with kate bishop and then you know, like she's like totally cool, level headed, they're joking, and then she jumps out the window like bah, 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 bang, you know, like <laughs> lands on the ground, like goes back up the stairs to try and kill him. It's like uh, all right, it's like zero to a hundred real quick. Like there's no the uh, you know, like uh, there's no consistency with her character. Yeah, I almost feel like it probably would have been better if she was just hired to kill Clint and there wasn't that whole she killed uh, or he killed uh, Black Widow, and then it was just more of her having to like struggle with the fact that oh she was hired to kill someone who was close to her sister, and her sister's now gone. And that's like one of her last few connections to him. I think that could have been a much more interesting uh, plot line than just you killed my sister. Oh wait, you didn't. I don't believe you. Oh, I guess I believe you. Yeah, it's also one of those things like uh, I feel like this takes away from uh, Dreyfus's character that like from what we've seen of the end of all the other series like. It seems like she's recruiting a bunch of people who have the potential to be villains in future movies. And now we find a like one of the main people we saw her recruit just kind of like tries to kill Clint and then gives up halfway through and decides not to kill Clint. And it's just it takes away from her position as like a puppeteer manipulating things behind the scenes. And now she's just like a goofball who's sending random bad people out to do one thing and then. If it works, great, and if it doesn't, also great. That's fine, doesn't matter. Well, the other issue is, we thought that she was building up to something big, like, you know, a government, you know, Dark Avengers team, but she's just, like, you know, auctioning her staff out to, like, low-level crime in New York. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it's and one of those things where, like... What could have worked... Uh, yeah. What could have worked is, had uh, Yelena, like, not shown up until, like, the final episode, have her be the big bad have uh have them show up and try to recruit kate bishop to be like the next evil team hawkeye because she's young and influential and all this stuff um because then yeah with with the the goal of her then with uh, yelena then killing hawkeye we could have then been introduced to the dark avenger storyline with them be like ah yeah you know, now Hawkeye's out of the picture, and now we have a, uh, you know, an evil Captain America, an evil Black Widow, and a evil, like a now compromised evil um, Hawkeye, you know, with all the others at the picture. Yeah. Yeah. I, but they didn't I do that. It could have been a very easy change of, they wouldn't even have to change that much about earlier in the season, and just have it be a generic Black Widow assassin who was hired to kill Clint, and have 
like maybe even tease that it's Yelena in the earlier episode. We know Yelena wants to kill him, but then have the mask come off and have it be someone completely different. And we find out that it's just a Black Widow assassin who was hired to kill Clint by Kingpin. And then have the final episode, have the Black Widow assassin come back and like, oh, it's this fucking bitch again. Only for her to take off the mask and we realize it's Yelena who's trying to kill him because uh, he killed her sister. I feel like that would lessen the effect that this dark Avengers team that they were kind of building up is now just like... I guess working for Kingpin, maybe, or being hired out to Kingpin. It's unclear, but well, it, it seems she has government influence, right, uh, for Dreyfus's character Val. So uh, it'd be weird if she was working for Kingpin. Although I guess if they want to step up Kingpin to be something bigger in the universe, that could be the case. Uh, we'll have to wait to see what the connection was, I guess, in the future. Uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where, like, the fact that it turns out Yelena was hired by kingpin or by the mother through kingpin uh, or the opposite i guess uh it just seems to take away the connection to that dark avengers that they were building up and just kind of seems like they're just a bunch of random people who are just going off causing chaos yeah and yeah we need to talk about this for a second because this also makes no freaking sense how hawkeye is introduced to be working with uh, kate bishop like the morning of and then that night when they're on the mission yelena shows up and is trying to kill him and he's like ah who hired you it's like how did so the mom like hired this secret assassin to go kill him after meeting him like a few hours ago well i think she recognized it's hawkeye so he's a threat because she would know that hawkeye's been doing stuff with the track suits and getting her sister involved uh, not her sister her daughter involved so i think it was more of I'm just going to nip this in the bud before it becomes a problem. But Which, she also tries to play herself off as... How quickly. Yeah, because she does try to play herself off as like, oh, I was doing all this to protect you, I'm a good guy. I was like, you did immediately hire a Black Widow assassin to just kill someone you met. Yeah, yeah, because it's, like... it's episode four when we... Oh, when Yelena first makes her fucking appearance as someone who's in that situation. Uh... But I feel like it was back in, like, episode two when Hawkeye starts doing things in the city, and the mother could have very well been like, we need to hire an assassin to kill off this person uh, before they start causing problems for us because they're looking into our organization. So it could have very easily been before she was revealed to the fact that she's working with Kate, just like, this is an Avenger, and creating an Avengers-level threat out of this situation and involving my... Not even involving my daughter, but just this is my daughter's role model, and it's very possible my daughter is going to want to get involved anyways. So yeah, it was it was just very vague and unclear how and when she was hired to show up and kill Hawkeye, because like she wasn't working with the tracksuits clearly, because she shows up and not working with Maya. Maya and her even start fighting just on the same roof. It's like, yeah, I think it was that moment when she makes the phone call in the her house. It's like, oh, I need your help for something. I think that's the yeah. scene it's supposed to be. Think, think logistically about that. Uh, so, like, let's say it's the morning. Like, hey, I need someone to kill this Avenger, and then you know she, you know who she contacts, who contacts Yelena by going and meeting them at that meeting spot at Black Widow's grave. She she shows up like, oh, hey, I know it's your day off. Here, how about this mission? Uh, she would have been like, oh, okay, I'll be there in like two hours. you know. So she gets there and then immediately is on the roof where she is. It's like where Hawkeye is in just a few hours. It's... <laughs> I mean, if we assume that uh, Val has access to, like, shield tech, like, level technology, with, a, like, they were able to cross the globe that quickly, so I wouldn't be surprised, you know, traveling to, between states would be that much of a hassle if she has, like, you know, uh, darn, what's their ship called again? The Quinjet? The Quinjet or something like that. It's not in the realm of impossible, but they would have had to be, like, very tight on it. Yeah, it was, it was just very, uh, ridiculous how fast this assassin gets contacted and shows up later in that same day 
Well, once again, I don't think it was necessarily the same day. I think it was potentially two days beforehand, based on the timing of the episodes. Yeah, each episode is its own day. Yeah, it was... Uh, also, uh, I feel like we're doing a lot of talk of, like, it's annoying how they didn't show this explicitly and make it clear. But I feel like if the show made a point of showing every single conversation that happened very explicitly, it would feel very dumbed down. Probably. And, like, we assume you don't know what's going on, so we're going to show you the scene where Kingpin sits down the mother and explains you need to hire an assassin to kill off <laughs> Hawkeye. And then we're going to show the scene where uh, the mother contacts Valentina to hire an assassin. We're going to have that conversation played on the screen. And then we're going to cut to the scene where uh, Valentina contacts Yelena and hires her to kill Clint. And then we're going to show the scene of Yelena traveling across the country in the Quinjet to get to New York. And then we're going to show the scene where Yelena's climbing up the fire escape to get up to the roof. So now, uh, exactly how she got ju the roof. just a minor correction, but I don't think uh, Kingpin was involved with the hiring of Yelena in any sense. I, I think that was Kate's mother going just, oh, I'm going to get rid of this before it gets up to him. Regardless, I'm saying if they made a point of showing every conversation so we can see exactly how something happened, it would make the show so much fucking dumber, and I don't think anyone would enjoy it at that point. That's right. If it's showing every conversation that's happening and assumes you're incapable of following a single plot point and has to show you every single detail as it's happening, I feel like that would be much to the detriment of uh, Now, there is something we've kind of been dancing around that I, I kind of want to get into, and that is what are your guys' thoughts on D'Onofrio coming back as Kingpin, and what do you think that means for the Netflix series? Especially with the fact that we've seen uh, Daredevil and Spider-Man. So I really like D'Onofrio coming back because I was a huge fan of D'Onofrio's Kingpin. One of the things I've said in the past, although I don't think I've said it on this podcast, uh, that I really enjoyed about D'Onofrio as Kingpin in the Marvel Daredevil series is that every other live-action iteration we've had of Kingpin has always just been like, they're a really big guy and they'll like crush someone's skull with their bare hands, and that's like the limit of their... Uh, threat to any of the major characters but the thing about uh, D'Onofrio is he did a really good job of just showing Kingpin as a mob boss or as a criminal overlord to the point where for most of the first season of Daredevil we don't see him do anything aside from like look at art and yet we're still intimidated by him the entire time and then we get to the final episode and it's like oh yeah by the way he can also crush someone's skull by kicking them in the head once and it's I feel like he did a very good job of showing a multi-dimensional uh, Kingpin, so I'm a big fan of him being brought over, because I was a big fan of him as Kingpin initially. If I'm not wrong, wasn't the first bout of like rage we've seen him do when he crushed the guy's head with the car? Yeah, yeah he takes someone's head off with a car door. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, I agree, Kingpin is phenomenal, it's a fantastic performance, he's one of the greatest villains of the Marvel franchise, so yeah, it was it was like a huge spectacle when he shows up and, and then they did him bad <laughs> they did him another poor service done by this show where he shows up for one episode gets beaten by a little girl who should have died the first time she got punched and then he runs away comes face to face with this other character who we're meeting for the first time in a show who hasn't really done anything and gets shot. And we're like, what, what was that? Like you, sh you throw Kingpin in there for one episode. And so on that topic, I don't know that Kingpin got shot. So one right. of the things they but do a very good job. We don't see it. Yeah. One of the things you always have to keep in mind with uh, Marvel is even if they imply something heavily, but do it off screen, you can never assume it went down the way you said. So seeing fucking uh, Maya pointing a gun at Kingpin and then they cut away to like an overview of the alley where you can't see either of them. And then we hear a gunshot. For all we know, he punched her right before she did and she shot the wall or something like that. Or... Fuck it, for all we know, Bullseye is in this universe as well. <laughs> he shot her before she could shoot him. I, there's a lot, a lot of uh, Netflix characters that are like up in the air of like, are they coming over? Really hoping for Burnthal to come over. Yeah. Uh, so regardless of all that, going back to the Marvel Daredevil series, what I assume and kind of hope is that it's kind of the same as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where it's loosely canon in that the characters will get brought over and the events that happened in the shows kind of happened, but they're not going to be so far as to like make direct reference to the things that happened 
and make it clear that they also happen to be MCU. It's all the character development that happened in the Netflix series, I'm hoping gets carried over and all the characters get carried over, but maybe less so the specific events need to be carried over as they happen. Yeah, due to reception. Knowing drag- yeah, knowing there's fucking dragon bones beneath New York City, that's a weird thing to add into this. Uh, MCU, so I mean, to be, I, uh, to be fair, I don't know if Dragon Bones under New York is the weirdest thing they could add in now after Shang Chi. That's fair. Uh, but uh, also, uh, I, if I had to say what like stuff coming over, I think there's a good like argument for obviously uh, Daredevil, Punisher, and the Jessica Jones stuff, just where that got a lot of good reception. Luke Cage was mixed and. Uh, Iron Fist was just kind of negative for the most part. So I don't think we should be expecting Finn Jones. Not just because people didn't like it, but I've also heard that Finn Jones was not a pleasure to work with. Well, also, his story has him taken out of New York. Yeah. So it makes sense that he wouldn't appear. I, I hope we do get Luke Cage, just for my own personal benefit of somewhere down the line, we get a scene where Luke Cage meets Blade and has a very confusing moment of, are you sure you're not Cottonmouth? Like, are you 100% sure you're not Cottonmouth? <laughs> Your sister didn't shoot you? Nothing like that? But yeah, I, that, I think that plays into the, like the loose connection where they can have Luke Cage show up and then they just won't acknowledge it, right? So uh, it's one of those things where I hope Luke Cage gets brought over. I hope all of the, at least the three, get brought over. Don't forget uh, Punisher. Uh, well, four would for, be for Punisher. Yeah. Three plus four. Punisher. Because if I say four, people are going to assume I mean the four defenders, not Punisher. So yes, the three plus Punisher. I hope they get brought over. If Finn Jones doesn't get brought over, it's a shame because I think the show had potential and it just wasn't done super well. So I feel like they could have done it but if the characters or if the actor was also just not fun to work with then that's fine i'm fine with them not bringing him over but we have real potential here to continue some storylines and have heroes sub in for villains so as we saw with the end of luke cage he uh, not he has to do some morally questionable stuff for the sake of good yeah and he becomes like uh, one of the crime bosses more or less by like running the um, um, whatever it is, that nightclub. Yeah, doesn't he also get like the Iron Fist guns? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, he. Um, so yeah, they have Luke Cage like in this questionable position. He even goes to Jessica Jones in her later s- series and says like, "Hey, look, I'm doing this. Uh, I need you to be ready to stop me if I go over the line." Um, and it's like, okay, well, what if he does go over that line, or he doesn't realize he is, and, like, you have Hawkeye Season 2, or whatever the next thing is, and Luke Cage is the quote-unquote antagonist, where it, you have both characters where they're both having that inner struggle because they both think they're doing the right thing, and then they have to, like, come to a head and take each other out. Oh, definitely, because there's a lot of good characters in Iron Fist, too, that i love to see to come over, and it'd be a shame to lose them, but at that, too, like, Jessica Jessica Henwick, who played Colleen Wing, is kind of, like, on the cusp of just quitting acting, apparently. Uh, Counter-argument to it being a Hawkeye thing. Now we have Spider-Man back to being a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, just whipping around New York. I feel like he'd be a perfect one to have Luke Cage show up in his next Spider-Man movie at some point in the future. It's just... Some guy who's running crime in New York, but isn't actually a criminal per se. Yeah, and sure, have another villain, you know, like the criminal mastermind putting them against each other. But that would be a way to have them show up, and then you have like the superhero fight against each other, which you know everyone. You know what you're describing right now. Fight each other. You're describing Dawn of Justice. <laughs> That's the exact um, movie you, you're you describing totally... to me right now. You're 100% just describing the Martha scene from fucking Donald <laughs> Why did you say that name? You know damn well it's going to work when Punisher rolls up to that club and sees Luke Cage and asks him, do you bleed? <laughs> Punisher's going to be the one to take him down, just a mere man fighting against someone he can't hurt. It's totally going to be Dawn of Justice, but done right. 
Except in this case, it's going to be a Spider-Man on the ground saying May, and Luke being like, that name means nothing to me, and then caving his skull in. <laughs> that's, that's where that series is going. Uh, also, something I just realized that uh, I'd be curious to see how they do, uh, because I would love to see Rosario Dawson return to the MCU in some aspect, because uh, she's great in everything she's in. But she plays Claire Temple, who is a version of the Night Nurse, while uh, Christine is another character in Doctor Strange, who's also a version of the Night Nurse. Yeah, they've had two Night Nurses. Well, one in the MCU and one not technically in the MCU. So yeah, it would be cool. Because I, I also agree, Rosario Dawson is great in fucking everything that she touches. Yeah, there's a lot of great characters. Obviously, you know, we wouldn't be here talking about all these amazing characters if it didn't have a huge impact and they weren't doing the right thing. So I have faith that, you know, we're going to see more of, you know, uh, really, uh, really strong positive performances in future uh, TV shows. Yep. I, I'm hoping they... Just not in Hawkeye. <laughs> so, oh my god why would you have kingpin show up and disappear just like that i mean i don't think he's dead and that's exactly what happened in the comics with echo's origin story as well yeah and and yeah roger like i know he's not dead but and, and i know like it was a scene where like yeah he's gonna be blind but you know it's like well, we have this really cool character what's he do yeah nothing really the, uh, the Actually, the other interesting thing is uh, D'Onofrio's even said that the Kingpin we're seeing is after season three of Daredevil, so whatever that means. Oh, that's yeah, so where cool. he was supposed to be, you know, done breaking New York City, and yet he's not. So. Oh, I believe the speculation is that he got blipped, and when he came back, there was like a large power vacuum that he just kind of started filling. Makes sense. Anyways, I'm just hoping that that's the future of the MCU, is just a whole bunch of, like, cameos and crossovers, and that's how they deal... Because we kind of discussed this during Spider-Man, but how the idea of the crossover being a cameo where a character appears to, like, give a piece of advice or hand over a piece of technology, so that you don't have to deal with why isn't Blank getting involved with this situation anymore, and we can kind of move past that and just have small little cameos, so... Perfect example to kind of bring more of the uh, Marvel Netflix series in is like in the upcoming fucking Lady Hulk series or She-Hulk series, uh, have Foggy Nelson appear as in a court case, maybe on the same side or opposite fucking She-Hulk, and we can have a reference to Matt Murdock without actually having to put Charlie Cox on the screen, and just kind of like build a more interconnected world and have characters appear in different things without having to make it all about the superhero team-ups and just have the worlds united and connected. Fair. Also, I believe that uh, She-Hulk would always be on the opposite side of Foggy, because I believe she's a prosecutor. You're right. Yeah. She would always be on the opposite side. Um, and yeah, like logically, this is where I want shows to be going, where you can just throw characters in and, like, they don't need big fanfare. They're just there for, like, one episode or a little bit. And then they get dealt with or they do their thing and then disappear. We kind of saw a bit of that with some of the uh, Defenders crossing over with each other. But... Uh... It just makes the world feel more real if they yes. have them cross over. But doesn't have to be a full-on fucking... This whole movie also involves these three other characters because they'd want to be involved. But instead, just having them appear for a scene, add a contribution, and then leave the movie makes the world still feel interconnected and real. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I was I was disappointed at, you know, uh, oh, Kingpin could have done so much more. It did feel, I will admit, it did feel kind of like a cop-out to have, I enjoyed that they put him in there because it, uh, is starting to bring over Kingpin and all of the Netflix uh, Marvel series. Is it's starting to bring them over into the MCU proper? I will admit it did seem a bit of a cop out to just have the final boss be the film we've already established, and have him really only have impact in this one episode. And beyond that, really like the one fucking scene that is his impact on the series. Yeah. So 
we've got we got Kingpin uh, and Yelena. Uh, did we talk about all the characters? Oh yeah, we didn't talk about the mom. And the mom, I saw coming a mile away. Oh yeah, that was very obvious. Yeah. Although most people thought she was going to be uh, Madam Mask is what a lot of people thought she was going to be. I thought she was going to be a villain that they'd have to fight because it almost kind of implied that like she trained her daughter in a lot of stuff. And because she was talking about how she needs to protect the family, it was like, okay, so show us how you've got all these badass skills. And then you have to be defeated by that flip trick that you taught your daughter. Um, but they didn't have that. The mom doesn't fight. The mom just questionably morally evil. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm fine with her not being like, oh, I throw off my dress and I'm wearing a full tactical battle suit underneath. Let's throw down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, well, actually, I, I would have been better if she had a tracksuit on underneath. That would have been the better version. Oh, my God, the tracksuit. <laughs> well, no, because she had quit at the at the time that they would have fought. Yeah. So. But, yeah, um, it was partially because of her casting. Like, the last thing I saw her in was when she was the mom from Godzilla, King of the Monsters. And then, you know, she has the heel turn where, you know, she's actually secretly evil. So, But ends like, up okay. uh, fighting for the good side in the very last scene. Yeah, yeah, but ends up like, you know, she sticks through, sticks true to some morals and then tries to do the right thing but ultimately can't. So, yeah, we have that exact same thing play out in in this show, where, yeah, it was clearly not Jack. Um, and it was really just that sort of lack of interesting new villains that uh, got me disappointed, where I was expecting uh, a cool new villain to show up. Like, I thought we were going to get multiple man. <laughs> now that's now that's a shot in the dark. Yeah, no, no, follow me here. So because we had um, the the guy who who's murdered, like whatever the third, Armand him? Duquesne. Yeah, yeah, Armand Duquesne, and then Jack is related to him, and then we have that kid who's like Armand Duquesne the fifth or whatever. Like I thought there was gonna be something about like this power struggle between them all. And and how Armand Duquesne is uh, like cloning himself, and that's how they're gonna fight this like army of punchable goons that you know we love seeing in Marvel. Is that it's gonna be this whole group of the same guy showing up, um, and, and you know that's what they have to deal with. I think we're still a little bit off of clones. I think that would be a little too convoluted with, you know, the whole concept of the scrolls being around now. But, but like, that would have been more interesting <laughs> than a group of guys in tracksuits being the big bad. Come on, bro. So I think part of the fun was the fact that it was just a group of guys in tracksuits allowed them to make fun of that in the fucking series, where... Fucking Hawkeye's like, yeah, it's the tracksuit mafia. And they're just like, really? That's the name they went through? I mean, I guess they were mafia in tracksuits, but honestly, that's the name you want to go with? Uh, or that one specific tracksuit guy that really likes Imagine Dragons. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, this is a really boring, really unimagined villain group. I mean, it's a villain group so that Hawkeye faces got, a lot in the comics. They've got characters, Roger, but it's not like, oh, the Flag Smashers. Oh, cool. Like, um, remnants of aim or hydra you know it was it was pretty low down the chain for an avenger to deal with when they could have gotten creative yeah but i i don't think everything needs to be big though yeah you kind of have to have these situations where it's slightly lower stakes and since the whole part of this i still think the hawkeye from the title is not clint barton i think it's entirely kate uh bishop is the hawkeye that they're referencing in the title that's why the final episode ends with her like coming up with what her name should be and then she says huh what about and then it cuts to black and shows hawkeye that's her deciding to take on the mantle of hawkeye herself i will admit i had fan four stick flashbacks when that happened that's very fair i was like oh god no not again so i assume uh 
Well, not I assume. I feel like this story was about Kate Bishop more so than Clint Barton and her kind of rising to the role. So to have her fight an Avengers level threat when she hasn't any threat before that seems a bit silly. So I think it's cool that they took a kind of ridiculous uh, group from Hawkeye's Rogues Gallery. I was like, hey, this is kind of a meme in the comic books, and it's a little bit silly, but this is a good way to introduce a character and have them deal with a not-Avengers-level threat, uh, but still have her work with an Avenger uh, to kind of deal with it. And it ties that story together and gives her an appropriate-level threat for who she is as a character to fight against. I would disagree on appropriate level. I mean, if you're talking about the tracksuit specifically, yes. But Kingpin, I feel like, is a bit above her punching grade. But again, they address that with Kingpin did not give a shit about who was there in that room. Yes, that's fair. Uh, Kingpin, absolutely above her grade. I was specifically referencing the tracksuit mafia. Yeah. You're 100% right. Tying Kingpin into that is having her punch above her weight. Now, of course, there's one other villain we need to bring up is Echo, um, Maya. I I thought I, I, really lame as a I, I mean I, I'd say I feel Echo was underutilized, but I felt the like they did a good like the actress at the very least did a good job with what they had. Yeah, I think I think they did well with the actress, and the actress played the role well. I do think she was underutilized, and they could have had better use of Echo. Yeah, and that's why I was saying earlier, like it felt like not Echo. It felt like her stuff was rushed, and it was just like. A lot, like I wouldn't be surprised if we found out there was like a lot of scenes with her that were cut. Uh, I guess we have to see where it goes, but uh, they, they, honestly, because I knew the Echo series was coming, I kind of expected they were just going to like have a lot of stuff like left on the floor for the Echo series. Yeah, they unwisely chose not to develop the character so they could save the development of the character for the actual Echo series, is what it comes across as. Whereas this could have been a chance for them to fully develop the character, have them be well established, and then have the Echo series be to put that character through the ringer, uh, essentially. Whereas yeah. now a lot of that Echo series is probably going to involve flashbacks to help develop her further. Yeah, we might even find out that Echo was the one who was shot in that Kingpin thing, and then the Echo series starts with her in recovery or something like that. Now, yeah. introducing a villain with immediately going into the villain backstory and origin story is like wow all right uh i there's no way we're getting this uh uh this character killed off anytime soon like, yeah well to be fair i don't think i even went into this expecting her to be a villain because uh, to me i don't even feel like the tracksuit mafia was villains per se they were just like an obstacle that was there uh, another thing antagonist more so than villain. another thing i want to point out is uh you guys probably already knew this but the actress that plays her uh aquala lecox is actually deaf and uh is actually amputated with the leg yeah they got a very good uh character, mm, actor to play her. you know it's great you know um obviously some much needed representation which was uh which was good to see but yeah she's very underutilized and I'll just get into my rant. So, like, the point of a villain is to challenge the heroes and make them better, to make them grow as a character. We didn't really have that, where she shows up and she uh, she berates Hawkeye for needing to rely on, like, the use of a hearing aid, whereas she doesn't. She's like, oh, no, my... Uh, my differences define me and make me stronger. You should, you know, you should learn to, um, like, not rely on such things and, like, and crushes it. And then you expect, like, oh, later on when they fight again, maybe Hawkeye, you know, uh, grows and learns from one of his, one of his three ongoing problems, one of which being, oh, like, now I have to defeat someone without the use of my hearing aid. But they never bring up the hearing aid issue again after he gets it after he gets it fixed it's not brought up or an issue again that's fair uh, although Which with kind of you know frustrating because like why was this a thing that he had to deal with for the first four episodes and then not again at all afterwards yeah that's fair like that, that... There's a lot of things that kind of just fell off and just weren't addressed again. Although for Maya being like a villain in the story, 
to me, she just felt like B story hero because she was going through her own like story of her being the good guy. And from our perspective, we saw her story, Kate's story, and Clint's story as all of them being main characters. Just hers end up taking like a side thing. So I never viewed her as a villain. It was just two hero paths crossing, essentially. Yeah, I just like she's obviously introduced as a villain, so that's how I'm going to be analyzing uh, her and Roger, her friend. Turns out to be, you know, obviously, um, like the the real issue. Um, but I I didn't get the point of him. So he yeah. was he, he was of course uh, uh, obviously uh, misleading her. Like the one person that she had that she could trust was obviously um, lying to her, responsible for her uh, her dad's death. Uh, and then, like, has to fight her, and then, but like, we we go up to this point in the series, up to pretty much the final episode, we we think nothing of this guy, thinking, well, he's lame, he's a doormat, just like Hawkeye calls him, because Hawkeye, you know, beats the crap out of him twice, and like gets a jump on him twice, and we never see him do anything, and then he shows up in the final episode, he catches an arrow going right for his face from Hawkeye, which is already a superhuman feat which he just <laughs> does out of nowhere. Uh, and then he proceeds to like have his martial arts fight with Maya. And and the whole time I'm like, what, is this guy menacing? Is he superhuman? I'm, I, I'm confused. Uh, uh, so I, I think this is one of the examples of uh, them assuming the people did their background research on the character because in the comic, Kazi the Clown is actually like a, like a high-ranking assassin. He's the guy who's the reason Clint is deaf in the comics. Yeah, but who's gonna... Oh, I, oh, I know, I know. Like I said, that's one of the problems of it, right? But like, yeah. And, and okay, so Roger, in the other source material, he's a high-ranking assassin. Where does that, you know... That can all high-ranking assassins just catch arrows out of the air? Uh, surprisingly, yes. Yep. Like, okay, in, in comics? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yep. <laughs> we haven't even seen Hawkeye or Black Widow do this. You know, we've seen no other character accomplish well, this the feat we that had... people have proven is not capable by human hands because people have tested to catch arrows and it's not possible. So, the... Part of the reason I assume we've never seen Hawkeye or Black Widow accomplish this feat is because Hawkeye is the only one who shoots arrows, so they're never in a situation where they would need to catch arrows. I'm willing to bet that if Hawkeye was to fire an arrow at Black Widow, she absolutely would have caught it, because that's just the way these things do. And we have seen someone catch an arrow before in the MCU. Granted, it was an Asgardian, but they're... Not like superhuman reflexes is, is a thing that they can do, but we've seen Loki catch a fucking arrow before, so it's not out of the question that this is an impossible task that he's completing. It's a task we've seen done before, and yeah, in by may see again. Yeah, by a god who went toe to toe with Captain America. Now, uh, Captain America, another person Hawkeye, that could definitely catch an arrow. Hawkeye, oh yeah, Cap could, but they've never shown. Despite the fact Hawkeye was working against the Avengers when he was first introduced, you know, in Avengers One. Yeah. Oh, he was first introduced in Thor. Oh yeah, that that's true. But like when when he's introduced to the other characters, he's he is shooting arrows at Natasha, and, and you know Black Widow and him have that fist fight. But yeah, anyway. Did like, he hit her with an arrow? Because I'll be honest, it's been a while since I've seen that scene. No. Did he hit her with an arrow? He, he hit her with the bow. Like, he puts down the bow and arrow, and they have a fist fight. Oh no, he has the bow. He's slapping her with that. He try, <laughs> but but yeah, like you get my point. Is that was a really ridiculous thing for him to just do when we haven't seen this character do anything else of remote value or. Uh, or skill level. You see, you can complain about that scene, but the fact that Kazi immediately says, nice shot, and then Clint fires back, no fucking shit, or something to those lines, yeah. it just yeah, makes the scene better. <laughs> but, but yeah, it was like, yeah, Clint wasn't expecting that, clearly. None of us were. 
and then it's like, oh man, like turns out this guy isn't a doormat. Turns out he is really cool. Now he's gonna get his uh, his chance to fight Hawkeye, and then oh no, no he's not. He's not gonna try and get the you know Hawkeye to take back what he said about him being a doormat. No, now he just has a fight with Maya. Oh yeah, I assumed it was gonna be him versus Maya just because again I, I clearly spotted the echo uh, like hero origin story happening and each person had to have their final fight yeah, yeah, and clint was very clearly going to be elena yeah clint was very yes. clearly lined up against elena unfortunately kingpin ended up being uh kate bishop's enemy like there was no interaction between uh kazi and kate so i never assumed that kazi was going to end up fighting kate uh, well no they fought in the i think it was episode three just before the chase scene but even then, they didn't really fight amongst themselves. It was more so Hawkeye causing a disturbance and her freeing herself and then running away. Yeah. Like, yes, yeah. they had a brief conversation, but there wasn't any built-up tension between those two characters. All the tension was between Yelena and Hawkeye, and Hawkeye's brief interactions with both uh, Maya and Kazi separately. But he was there kind of stirring the pot, egging them against each other. So, And the, Kazi... Uh, Kazi, yeah. like, yes, I, I agree with what you're saying, but Kazi's introduced in all of his dialogue and his mannerisms as being the calm, cool, collected one, where he's able to talk down Maya, Maya, who's on the warpath, and, and yeah, it's because Kazi is, like, the, the calm, cool, collected one that, you know, you get the sense, all right, he's, you know, he's not the fighter, but he is, you know, like, the intelligent uh you know cool collected I'm one. the exact opposite from you in that case where the moment someone is introduced in a criminal organization as the calm cool there's no need to fight situation i automatically assume they throw the fuck down when it comes time to fight because that's just such a trope of this is the person talking you out of fighting but it's not because they can't fight it's because they just don't want to be bothered and if they do have to fight they will absolutely kick your fucking ass well his motivation was he was scared of kingpin as we find out yeah so the fact that he was trying to talk uh, maya out of fighting didn't lead me to the assumption of uh he's incapable of fighting it very much so led me to the side of this guy could absolutely kill maya if he wanted to he just doesn't want to yeah i didn't really come to that conclusion but but evidently you were right, because, yeah, he turns out to be capable um, in all five seconds that we see him being capable um, <clears throat> before he's killed. But how much better would it have been to introduce as a villain Bullseye, who we show is not dead, but if Bullseye had shown up working for Kingpin, well, that would have really made sense. But, also, uh, ha uh, debuting a uh, bullseye in the MCU not against Daredevil is like a crime. But like he's already been a villain there. Oh, he's been a villain in the Netflix series, but having him appear in the MCU like for the first time, not fighting Daredevil, I feel like is just it's a that's a screw up. Yeah, it would have been again another more interesting villain to have Hawkeye, you know, do his thing against. So, yeah. Um, I, again, like, <clears throat> wasted potential, I, I feel. But, okay, so Maya is getting her own show as Echo, or getting another appearance, however we see her. Yeah, there'll probably be some Daredevil tie-ins with that one as well in some aspect, considering they're closely tied uh, story-wise, but yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah, so... That'd be cool. Um, and we can we can do more with her being, you know, a um, a deaf character because we didn't get to see that in Hawkeye, where you know they bring it up as a point of conflict or something he has to overcome. And no, he just deals with it for the most part for four episodes, and then not again. Uh, to be fair, I don't think that's the best way to write a character of. Here's a disability. Their entire character description is that they have this disability. Having a character who is deaf, but not making every scene about them being deaf, is a better way to write a deaf character. So, yeah. like, and 
<clears throat> and they did it well. And of course, it goes towards Maya's character of how the of how she, you know, doesn't let it de- doesn't let it de- define her, and she's you know like stronger because of it. But uh, <clears throat> but because she gets after Clint about how oh you need to do this, you know, uh, because this is like the villain moment of like showing up and telling you you need to be stronger. Normally, that's when the hero goes off, gets stronger, and then comes back. Uh, but, you know, Hawkeye could already, you know, kick her ass. Kinda. So, yeah. Uh, there was no growing stronger or developing as a character. And then, really, the three things that Hawkeye was dealing with throughout the series... Um, turned out to be non-issues. There's like, will he get back in time to see his family on Christmas? You know, every episode they're, you know, they're like assuring each other, like, yep, yeah, we'll get you back, or yep, yeah, you know, um, I'll be back in time for Christmas. Um, I mean, there is no doubt on that one. That I'm not going into any Avengers or MC movie assuming that the good guys lose. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I mean, there was a one time we got blindsided. Yeah, but Thanos was the main character of that one, thus the good guy. Yes. And, well, not good guy, but... He wanted to had... save the world's uni- uh, resources. He was a good guy. <laughs> but we even see the scene of them watching It's a Wonderful Life and, like, the guy running up the stairs and hugging his family. It's like, well, we're clearly going to get this scene later in the show. So, yeah, uh, so, yeah, he doesn't really need to change or do anything different or, like, make any sort of sacrifice to to make his deadline and get there in time for Christmas. That happens, no conflict, no issue. Um, Him being deaf, they they drop that hook after the fourth episode, and that stops being an issue. And then him getting over... Uh, quote unquote getting over uh, Natasha's death from the events of Endgame he we have that scene where he sees Kate Bishop hanging off the roof and he has a chance to save her and then he has this like flashback moment um, had that that was normally the kind of event that you'd have at the end of the show and he has to learn to let go because he never really did back in like back in the previous events where she made that choice for them. Um, but in this one, he just, he like pauses for a second and is like, nah, cuts the cord, says like, get out of here. And then, you know, goes back to fighting, like not even a, a moment spent there. Like he, uh, <clears throat> you know, yeah, he's still in mourning, but he never stops mourning. If anything, he just, you know, uh, he he just had to speak out loud about what's going on about something he already. Uh, I, it's a conversation he already had with Kate Bishop, but now he's just having it again with Yelena. And after he has it, then his other third problem or arc is, uh, I guess, resolved. Quote unquote. Nothing changes about him or his character. Well, that's where I think the idea that it's more on Kate Bishop uh, for the character development is, and not so much him. His character is already at, like, its end story-wise, really. I don't suspect we'll see him a lot more, aside from just a teacher role, because his character development as a character has been done for, like, three movies. Yeah, his whole arc has been getting to retirement, to the point where he retired in fucking, uh... A a, a few movies. He, He retired in a few movies. Yeah, but, like, I feel like Ultron was the one where he was just straight up done being an Avenger, and he kept getting dragged back to the point where he didn't even participate in Infinity War because he wasn't an Avenger at that point. He was fully retired. So the show was never about giving him an arc and having him develop, because his development at this point is passing off the mantle so someone else can be Hawkeye. That's the entirety of the arc he has to go through and recognizing that someone else is capable. So that's what we see happen. In the beginning, it's him not wanting to interact with uh, Kate at all, him trying to exclude her, uh, him realizing he could maybe trust her a little bit, only to be told by the mother that he really shouldn't be trusting her. 
So he backs off again and keeps trying to cut ties until we get to the final fight where he fully trusts Kate and works with her fully as a partner. That's the arc that he goes through, and it's not him learning to make friends or him learning about teamwork. It's him learning that he can trust someone else to carry the mantle for himself, and he can actually fully put down the mantle of Hawkeye and trust that other people will be around to carry that mantle in his stead. So to say he doesn't have an arc kind of takes away from what the show is about, because as I've said before, and I will say again, the Hawkeye from the title is not Clint Barton. The Hawkeye from the title is Kate Bishop. She's the one who has to grow and change. It's just that Hawkeye is the one we know of as Hawkeye, and his growth is different from what you might expect for a character. Just in terms of where he started as a guy mourning Natasha with hearing issues, hanging out with his family, is exactly where he ends. You know? And he wasn't even a- being an active Avenger. Were so. you expecting him to magically have his hearing problems go away or his family to die? Like, all of that stuff was obviously all going to continue being the state at the end of the movie. Him but being like, a man with a family who has a hearing issue is where he was at the beginning, and none of that stuff things was are going, going to go away. Not saying things are going to improve, but, like, it's this exact status quo. I'm just saying is... that the change isn't what was going on in his personal life. The change is the willingness to trust Kate Bishop. That's the change he went through. In the mm-hmm. beginning, he did not trust her at all and didn't want to bring a child into this, and by the end, he recognized her as a capable fighter on her own and fully included her in her plans to stop the big man in charge of New York. That is the growth that he went through. Yes, and we, we did see, you know, like th- this does play out well with her and, and her growth. So, yeah, it, it worked for... Uh, her taking on the mantle of uh, uh, or what we assume will be her taking over the mantle of Hawkeye in future projects or movies. Yeah, I agree. It's like Hawkeye is not by far the greatest thing. I don't think it's on the worst spectrum. It's a middle of the pack thing. And that's the thing. Something being middle of the pack Marvel is not horrible. It's going to happen. There's going to be the worst Marvel thing. There's going to be the middle Marvel thing. And there's so much now, and they all have their own quality level compared to other things that I think that's just how it is. Yeah. And it's the case with all of these MCU series, with the exception of a couple, none of them have really stood on their own as a very interesting and overwhelming story on their own. They all feel like they're putting in the work of giving us the story to set up future movies without us having to have a whole movie that is Iron Man 2, which is just (laughs) learning how to fucking be Iron Man and cure his poison. Like, if the MCU and Disney Plus had existed back then and we got Iron Man 2 as a fucking Disney Plus series, people would be talking about how it's not as good as Iron Man 1. That's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a series that does the heavy lifting. So when we go into future movies, these characters are established and we don't have to go through a whole movie of backstory. Exactly. Whether we see it or not, that's... Uh, at the moment, it's going to probably have that payoff that shows why it was important in the long run. Yeah. So anyways, I feel like that's hopefully enough arguing about this show. <laughs> wait, yeah. wait, wait. How did Jack get the candy? When Kate initially suspects him being a villain. I mean, he's uh, he's an Armand. He's a Duquesne as well. We just probably got it from the Duquesne factory. Yeah, the family probably just all of them have that candy, and she just assumed him having that candy meant he was in the house. It was, it was their family candy, and he's a member of the family. <laughs> it's another plot point that gets brought up, and then I mean, he's he's just a Duquesne. He could have the candy. Oh yeah, and I. I fully suspected it was just another of you know the many many red herrings. <laughs> like saying Bless. how did uh, how did Kate get her bow? We don't see the scene where she gets her bow. It's just a bow. Anyone can have a bow. These are the plot points that get brought up and then <laughs> sort of just dropped. Speaking of just dropping, uh, moving on to. Uh, what are your guys' recommendations for uh, our listeners this time? Uh, I'm going first because I have a sneaking suspicion there could be some overlap, and I just don't have a backup thing. Uh, so my recommendation is people go back and watch the Marvel Netflix Daredevil series to get all the backstory on Kingpin before this series. 
because it's loosely canon and it's also just a very fucking fun watch. So mm, yeah, good. The Marvel good Daredevil pick. series on Netflix. <laughs> and what do you got for us, right. Thomas? So, uh, for people who don't know, um, Apple TV has its own streaming service. Oh. Apple has its own streaming service called Apple TV. If you have a PlayStation 5, you get a six-month free trial of Apple TV. So you heard go it check here. that out. Buying a PlayStation 5 from a scalper because you get six months free of Apple TV if you do. It pays for itself. So, so I recommend uh, checking out uh, <clears throat> Greyhound. Greyhound on Apple TV is fantastic war movie. Uh, really cool. Check it out if you haven't already. Me and all the military guys just love it. Uh, so for my recommendation, I'm kind of staying in the Hawkeye wheelhouse. I'm actually going to recommend the comic run, My Life as a Weapon, which this series was very heavily based off of. Uh, it does a few things differently. Uh, one of my favorite moments is, uh, uh, you might remember the argument between Kate and uh, Hawkeye about the use of a boomerang arrow and how useful it is, and Clint's very against it. That's reversed in the comics, where Kate's like, why the fuck would you want a boomerang arrow? And then she actually ends up using it correctly to save the day. That's kind of funny. Uh, so... Uh, you can check that all out using the... Uh, <laughs> app that we talked about last time. Do you have some sort of, like, promotion, like, deal with these organizations that we don't know about? Yeah. Uh, use the name Thomas Sheehan, <laughs> double space, uh, in order to receive 5% off. <laughs> or use the code Peter Akerley to pay 5% extra for the service. <laughs> Just like if you were going to any movie place as Peter. Yeah, if uh, you get to live my life and pay double to see a movie because they know you're going to cause problems if they actually let you in for normal pricing. Uh, now, uh, we do have a correction from a previous episode. Uh, so this comment was from a Fatal Failure Collection on our Arcane episode. Uh, and they were actually referring to when we were mentioning why Victor just didn't go back to get Shimmer uh, for the rest of his experiments. Uh, and he points out that by the time that he runs out of Shimmer, the bridge is very locked down and covered by complete military forces, so he wouldn't have been able to cross back over. That's a really good point. We did not consider that. Yep, completely missed. Uh, well, I, I don't think we missed it. I think we just completely forgot about it. Yeah. Yeah, because the first time he comes back with Shimmer is just when the lockdown's starting. Very nice. Good point, uh, person who keeps writing out the name of it. Uh, fatal Furry. Uh, not Furry. Fatal fu uh, Failure Collection. Fatal Failure Collection. I guess we're a part of your collection now, because fucked that up. <laughs> uh, and as for uh, the question from of the last episode of who is your favorite Spider-Man or Sp Spider-Man film uh, we had uh, no one say anything on that one so it's good everyone decided just to keep their mouth shut and not cause a problem yeah that, we probably would be fighting now if we actually heard answers to that question whatever you would have said it would have been the wrong answer <laughs> Uh, so for a question for this one, uh, well, I guess we didn't really uh, finish it off like normally would by saying, you know, what did what did you think like overall score out of ten or, you know, no, no, I, I, just a simple ranking question will not do. We need something that forces people to actually think and not give us a number. What is a good villain? that you want to see... Uh, I'm telling you right now, that's yeah. a terrible question because I know one of the answers we're getting. <laughs> oh, really? Because it might be an answer that I'm going to tell you when it was guessed for the episode. Uh, I'm sure you will. Uh, I, I guess, fuck it, whatever. Uh, go ahead with your question. Tell us, we're going to get to the answer regardless of what the question is. All right, so what is a good villain that you want to see introduced into the MCU? Uh... My answer to that question is Mothman, so I can steal it from that. <laughs> do, do you have a specific one, or are you going to stick with uh, Multiple Man? You know what? I'm pretty hard committed to Multiple Man. Got to prove myself right at some point. Uh, I'm trying to think. So for a villain I would like to get introduced... Um... 
You know, Onslaught could be really cool, but we need the Marvel characters, to get, like the X-Men characters, to get introduced first. Yeah. Or, or evil uh, Rogue. Because Rogue, when she was first introduced in the villain, was pretty cool, too. Yeah. Although that's, that's mainly just I want Rogue, my favorite X-Men, to be introduced. Fair enough, I guess. Alrighty, then. Okay, uh, so... If anyone has guessed this episode, let's take a look. Uh, as you already know, we've had one guess from uh, Hana J underscore 13, and she suggested that today's episode was going to be about Mothman. Or my life as a weapon. I, I don't think you can anagram that in any aspect. Alright, cool. <laughs> uh, wrong, thank you for saying uh, but of course, there is a few days before this episode goes up from recording, so if you happen to guess it correctly in that meantime, we will make sure to announce that when the episode goes live. Yep. Good luck. We'll sh be sure to call you out. So yeah, uh, thank you for joining us in today's episode. Uh, make sure to reach out to us at whatismypodcastabout at gmail.com. That is spelled the way words normally are. You can tell us if you have an idea for what our podcast is about. Fanuary is coming up soon, so make sure to get those suggestions in. On top of that, you can follow us on Instagram, where we update the information about the episodes going up and have guesses where you can yourself try to guess what the episode is with a hint photo that goes up each time. And you can find us on YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe to the channel, like, comment, rate the podcast, and all the episodes go up there the same day. And finally... Next time, when we meet up in a fortnight, do you have any ideas what the episode might be about, Peter? I'm not entirely certain, but I do know we're probably going to toss a coin to a butcher who may or may not be burning. Topical. Like topical cream? Is it a rash that's causing the butcher to burn? Knowing the singer, probably. Probably. <laughs>